<laughs> uh, here we go again. <clears throat> Hi there, and praise Bob, everyone. Welcome again, once again to my kitchen here live on YouTube on Saturday night, which demonstrates I have no life other than that I uh, enjoy doing these videos. And I'm very, very flattered that uh, some people have uh, shown up already to watch. I appreciate that. Um, this one here is going to be a little strange. In fact, that's my intention. I want it to be plenty strange. And in fact, uh, some people who have seen my previous videos might even end up considering parts of this to be offensive. And I am warning you of this in advance because we talk about such subjects as religion here on, uh, in this uh, particular subject. And what is the subject? What else? But uh, the church of the subgenius. You see, um, <clears throat> the whole point here is that uh, today is October 10th, 2020. Exactly 10 years ago on this night was October 10, 2010, the magical date of 10 10 10. And I was uh, fortunate enough then to attend the great New York Subgenius Revival that took place in uh, Manhattan uh, at a, um, there, um, again, at about, yeah, as I said, it was 10 years, uh, 10 years ago, uh, within uh, not quite walking distance, but pretty close to the World Trade Center. And um, <clears throat> that was uh, really an interesting time. Um, and here's where I guess I hope you don't mind me telling personal stories. Um, I know I've done so previously, and I and again I hope people don't find them too boring. Meanwhile, I guess before I go any further here, we've got ourselves some chicken. No kidding. And we have ourselves here the Lodge cast iron fish fryer pan. And while we're not going to be frying fish tonight, this is definitely a um, pan where you can fry just about anything. I've got, in fact, I've got four quarts of peanut oil in here uh, so that we can fry some chicken. And uh, there's a, a good reason why I'll be, uh, why I chose to do chicken tonight. What I am doing right now is uh, trying to uh, get the uh, temperature up to uh, the right, you know, to uh, where it's supposed to be. And we are actually uh, getting pretty close right now, as you can see. Well, let me try that over here. Uh, we are getting pretty close. Oh, yeah, one other thing. There we go. Didn't forget this time. Um, so we're, um, I'm aiming, actually, for this to uh, hit somewhere between 365 and 375. Technically, the frying temperature is um, 350 degrees, but I find actually going just a little bit over that uh, does a better job frying the chicken, largely because when you put the chicken into the oil, there is, of course, a huge temperature drop. Um, so if the uh, temperature is up a little higher, the temperature drop is not quite as extreme, and hopefully we can keep the oil up about 300 degrees this whole time. Um, another thing, though, is that, that again, this uh, lodge... Uh, uh, fish fryer pan here is quite frankly a huge beast. I think this thing is like about 16, maybe 17 inches across and at something like 11 or 12 inches in, um, wide. I forget the exact measurements, unfortunately, <laughs> partly because I'm so nervous from doing these live things. And uh, there's so much room here in this pan that I can do a full eight pieces of chicken at a time. And uh, the temperature drop will not be quite as extreme as, uh, say, when you do it in a a, uh, regular size cast iron pan. So I'm uh, very, yeah. So yeah, I do indeed enjoy this uh, large fish fryer. And uh, granted, I have to admit, it's kind of expensive. I won't deny that. Lodge sells this on their website with a $100 price tag, but you may be able to uh, obtain it or something similar uh, at, a, uh, at a lower price. So anyway, hello, uh, Daniel Metheny from Doylestown, Ohio. William Hurd, I don't believe in religion. Oh, good. Then you've come to the right place. Uh, who's that guy on your shirt? Just some random white guy, uh, Miss French Twist. Well, this actually is the sacred image of J.R. Bob Dobbs, and he was 
and still is actually a very important part of my life uh, because for a good 17 years or so, uh, from 1994 through at least 2011, I was Reverend Motomac of the uh, Church of the Subgenius. In fact, I was a fully paid up subgenius minister. And uh, especially because I think some of the people on this uh, on this uh, channel here tonight may not know about the details of the Church of the Subgenius. Let me inform you very briefly. We are, quite frankly, a religious cult, and we fully admit it. We are a cult for mutants, disbelievers, scoffers, mockers, uh, those who uh, essentially feel that uh, life Life is one huge joke, and uh, let's put it this way. Have you ever felt sometimes that there is this gigantic worldwide conspiracy where the entire world or even in the entire universe is plotting to make your life a living hell? I mean, you, you personally. Well, guess what? You're right. There is a conspiracy, and that's, the, and that's what Bob found out. There is indeed a conspiracy to make your life miserable. Who are the perpetrators of this conspiracy? Normal people, average people, them, the powers that be, the people in charge, the ones who want to make your lives and my life monotonous, boring, and above all, um, safe and uh, without questioning. So, uh, <clears throat> and so what our real intent to do is to, uh, well, just that, to uh, open everyone's eyes, battle the conspiracy, uh, in, and especially to fight the, you know, to fight the conspiracy with a, with a good sense of humor. That is a really long and complicated subject, and I'm not going to get into all of it, especially since some among other things, there is actually a full feature-length documentary on the Church of the Subgenius coming out uh, in only about uh, 10 days on October 20th. It is going to be on video on demand. And I'm not just talking somebody who made a YouTube video. I'm talking about a professionally produced uh, YouTube uh, documentary that's been shown in uh, several f uh, film festivals because the Church of the Subgenius has been around since 1953. Three. Of course, it went public in about 1979, and, and during the 1980s, quite frankly, there were times when you simply could not walk anywhere uh, without seeing the image of Bob. Bob was one of the first clip art memes to be spread all across the country. Uh, his face showed up everywhere during the 1980s, and he was uh, really the ancestor of those graffiti art campaigns you see today, you know, stuff like obey or uh, the flying spaghetti monster or other things like that i mean they all owe bob a debt of gratitude and they owe him money too and they really damn well better pay up some at some point um okay so now that i've uh, been talking so much let's see how the oil is hey we are at uh, the right temperature so in that case we can uh, start ourselves some frying and then uh, we will go on from there Yeah, because there's a story behind this chicken, too. Oops, don't splash the oil. I said don't splash it. This time, in fact. This is the tricky one. Come on. There we go. Because you gotta love the crispy bits. There we are. And that's what I mean. We've got eight pieces of chicken all frying up here. And as you can see, there's plenty of room, too. The, the pan isn't even crowded. Uh, this chicken here actually is an important part of my celebration of the 10th anniversary of the uh, Great Subgenius Devival that took place 10 years ago on this night. You see, um, that's one of the things uh, our church really loves doing, and that is throwing parties. I mean, we are definitely one of the most 
fun-loving uh, cults uh, I think you will ever encounter. And one of the things we do is, uh, you know how some people go to religious revivals? Well, we throw religious devivals. And uh, the one I'm talking about took place in New York City at a uh, great, at a uh, really fancy uh, rock and nightclub too. And I can't believe I've forgotten the name of it. Something collective. Oh God, I hope somebody can refresh my memory. Um, what did I bread the chicken with? Oh good, I'm, gl I'm glad you asked. And Tom uh, Bel uh, Belot or Below, congratulations, you're a paid up minister. Praise Bob. And Ms. French Twist, I'm uh, Church of the Subgenius. You can also look it up on Wikipedia, by the way. We've got a very long entry on uh, Wikipedia with a lot of details there. Oh, yes, yeah, so it is. It seems like uh, the Star of Chaos is uh, on Bob Dobbs' head or even on his third eye. So, wow, that's a good sign right there. <laughs> and Tom Saddleberger, hello from Clifton, New Jersey. I purchased the fish pan after you used it. Well, well, I'm just, oh, I'm glad you like it. So, I mean, that's the important thing. I mean, it's, as I said, it's something of an expense, but really the important thing is that you enjoy it. And anyway, um, having said that, actually now, I'm going to jump ahead, use Subgenius Time Control, and jump forward to uh, the hours after this great revival ended on the eve on the uh, yeah really it was like about midnight on uh, Saturday night July um, sorry Saturday night uh, October 10th. You see, reason why is uh, first of all, picture this. As I said, we were really partying at a nightclub there. I mean, we have rock bands for our uh, for our revivals, um, and so and we and there was also a real wedding that took place, and I'll get into that as well. And so we all dressed up for the occasion. My uh, girlfriend, my closest, my closest friends and I, we all dressed up in Ren Faire outfits for the occasion. So uh, this was in the middle of New York City, mind you. So we got out of the club in our Ren Faire outfits. And we got into a cab to get back uh, to the hotel. And here is, um, <clears throat> on our way back to the hotel, I guess I should also say this was my... My very first time actually visiting New York City. Uh, I've driven through, I had driven through New York City many times on various road trips, some for work, some personal, but this was the first time I had actually uh, had the opportunity to really visit the city, stay in a, a hotel, and, uh, did, and check some of the things out. And there were a lot of things in New York City that I had never seen before, one of which we were riding in the cab going across, uh, coming back from uh, the, you know, going back to the hotel. And something caught my eye out of the side of my eye as we were riding back. And that was a uh, logo, Kennedy Fried Chicken. Now, if you live in the New York City area, you know Kennedy Fried Chicken and Crown Fried Chicken are all over the place. This was my very first time seeing it. And I commented uh, to my girlfriend at that time, you know, gee, can Kennedy Fried Chicken, it's though they were trying to cash in on KFC or something. At which point she got all excited and blurted out, oh, we're eating there tonight. And I said, what, there? Yeah. Uh, okay. <laughs> so we got back to the hotel and then uh, we went out for a uh, we went out for a cheap fried chicken. So we were walking the streets of New York City dressed in Ren Faire garb on a Saturday night at 1 a.m. to go to um, a uh, Kennedy Fried Chicken where they serve their uh, chicken behind bulletproof glass and the uh, customers look like <laughs> there is a good reason why they served it up behind bulletproof glass to uh, get ourselves a nice box of chicken, fries, and, and their uh, rolls. The fries were soggy and, uh, well, they were still warm, I will say that. Those so-called rolls were practically inedible. They were stale and ugh, <coughs> made you cough. But the chicken turned out to be pretty darn good. And that was my very first experience with cheap New York fried chicken. And I fell in love after that night. I mean, I enjoyed very much New, uh, Kennedy fried chicken, crown fried chicken. 
um, it was really after that point that I started seeking out uh, uh, Crown Fried Chicken and Kennedy Fried Chicken because I found out, and I still think today, this stuff is much better than KFC. So uh, we, anyway, this was uh, one, of the, one of the many things I discovered that night 10 years ago. And uh, that's the reason why I'm celebrating with chicken here, because um, I spent a few years um, learning how to cook and uh, even got down to my first fried chicken, which I'm pleased to say I'm it's, so far. My chicken has turned out not too bad. Um, what I found out, though, is that there are a whole bunch of so-called imitation KFC recipes on the Internet. There are, appear to be no recipes for an imitation of crown fried chicken. And, of course, people will say, well, why should they? They're cheap. They're cheap chicken. I still say the chicken is better than KFC. And when I did some digging, however, I did actually find the secret to uh, crown fried chicken. And that is the stuff. This right here is the breading that they use at those uh, cheap chicken places. Uh, I found it from the, uh, I actually found their supplier where they uh, do think, where they sell pretty much uh, just about everything you see in those restaurants, including those uh, bags and name tags and, uh, and everything with the Crown Fried Chicken logo. So that's how I know this is the real stuff. And just from the smell of it, it certainly is too. So that is why I felt I had to celebrate tonight with not just fried chicken, but with crown fried chicken. <coughs> so anyway, that's my story of uh, what happened there. <laughs> uh, Ms. French Twist, that pan is everything. Frying chicken requires being spaced so it can crisp. Oh, definitely. No question about that. And fortunately, things are uh, looking pretty good. Um, hmm. okay. I can see we still have a few minutes yet before we flip the chicken. But anyway, as I mentioned, uh, this really was my very first trip to New York City. Um, 10 years ago, 2010 through 2011, my entire life turned upside down. I think I've mentioned that a few times now in these live chats, and I've mentioned it on my Facebook and the like. Um, it was really, I mean, pretty much Everything in my life changed. I mean, you name it. About the only single thing that did not change, as it turned out, was my job, my conspiracy job. I actually somehow managed to keep my job, but everything else, uh, all the way from my uh, marital status, my weight, my even my friends, as it turned out, um, my my occupations, my hobbies, my locale. I moved to a new location that year. Um, and it was in December of 2010 that I discovered cast iron and caught the cooking bug. And I'm going to go into a little that a little bit more in December when I celebrate my, my cast iron anniversary. But um, in October, meanwhile, things were really uh, hopping and going crazy for me at that time. And I had, um, at this point, I was quite frankly uh, in a, I was dizzy with anticipation and excitement because my whole life had changed. And I was had a, uh, and I had a, you know, some people who I was very close to introducing me to a whole bunch of new things. And this was the first time I was actually free to uh, go and celebrate my life with no boundaries. In my entire life, I was pretty much free to do anything I wanted. And so what I really wanted to do was join my, join my closest friends in New York City and, uh, ha and uh, throw a big party, which is what they did. In fact, this uh, subgenius survival, as I mentioned, in addition to... Uh, preaching by the by uh, Reverend Ivan Stang and ranters galore uh, and the rock bands. There was a genuine wedding, in fact. Two of uh, my good friends from uh, X-Day, from the X-Day drills, and, and yeah, you'll need to read up on that as well on the Subgenius website or the Wikipedia article. Uh, two uh, good friends were married that very night. Uh, Reverend Ivan Stang married the two of them uh, because he is not only a, uh, a uh, cult leader, he is, in fact, a uh, 
properly ordained minister and can perform, can perform legal weddings, which is what happened there. The two persons there, uh, are their names are actually pretty well known among the uh, subgenii, and that would be Reverend 808 and Reverend Gigglepuss. They were married there before our eyes 10 years ago, and tonight is their 10th anniversary. Congratulations to them. Of course, since it's a Saturday night and their 10th anniversary, um, yeah, I'm pretty sure they're celebrating their uh, anniversary, you know, a little more personal than maybe showing up here on a YouTube video. <laughs> but I did send them a link to this, and I told them that they can indeed watch uh, the video after this is uh, all done. Um, as I mentioned, we... Um, we prepared for the wedding, though, in a number of ways, including preparing some very special gifts for them. And here's where I, my uh, good friends, um, one of whom I probably should not mention in subgenius circles because there you know, have been some <laughs> drama that I'm not going to uh, get into because I don't do that. But the other is uh, another friend of mine who I mentioned a number of times, Reverend Panic Evelyn Bedlam. And she is a wonderful artist. She is, I guess you could call her, um, no, her artist, her art is done in a comic book type of style. And she has produced several comic books. But she is more of a uh, portrait artist, and she produced this wonderful, wonderful pop art portrait of uh, 808 and Gigglepuss uh, that we were able to present to them as a present at the wedding. We also presented to them a uh, pair of uh, bondage collars, literally two collars joined by an unbreakable chain, which they uh, accepted gladly and wore for the rest of the night. Um, I'm not sure if they still have it. That's really their business. But uh, yeah, so we really enjoyed ourselves preparing some uh, great, some great gifts there. Um, let me see now. Congratulations and kudos to the couple. Well, again, thank you very much. Uh, Honey Badger Survival learned a lot from your wealth of information. Well, again, thank you very much. Uh, I used to go to Wren festivals. I love Glen Rose, Texas. Oh, yes, the Stang Ranch is at Glen Rose. And I know there's another friend of mine as well uh, who lives in Glen Rose. Uh, I'm not sure what her subgenius name is right at this moment, so I'm not going to uh, repeat her name. Um, Okay, despite the fact that I'm uh, rambling on and on and on, I mean, everybody, please uh, feel free to comment. I mean, you can, you can still really pretty much comment on uh, whatever you feel about, whether, you know, whether any questions as well, as always, about cast iron. And please feel free to answer the, any of those questions, too. I mean, this is, uh, this is a uh, live chat, and I'm not uh, trying to dominate the chat. I mean, please feel free to pipe in. Um, <clears throat> and besides, there's a lot more yet. About the Church of the Subgenius. <laughs> uh, the chicken looks good and crispy. Well, I hope we're getting to the point now where I think we may be able to uh, flip this batch over. So. Come on. Oh, that's a good sign. One, two... Three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Hmm. I better hope I didn't get this uh, too hot. Let's check this right now. No, it's jumped. It's uh, dropped down somewhat, of course because of all the chicken, so that's fine. So in about another eight minutes or so, we can check the temperature and uh, see if this first batch is done. Um, I'm waiting for the chance to temporarily marry someone. Oh yeah, that's one of the, uh, one of the many uh, fun and great things we have in the Church of the Subgenius. Um, we may not have pi we may not have invented it, but we've certainly popularized the idea of a short duration personal marriage, meaning that you can in the it is completely legal in the Church of the Subgenius to marry somebody temporary, so that you can go get yourselves married for say twenty four hours of time, 
uh, 24 hour period and then go and do the things that married couples do free of sin because you are in fact married at which point then after uh, the time period elapsed unless you wanted to continue um, you are free to marry someone else or go your separate ways or the like uh, we have we have folks of course who do things like marry their car keys or marry their uh, computers or marry their <clears throat> toys um or marry their cast iron pans you know i have to say no i have not done that yet i should probably uh make arrangements to do that um that's one of the many things here uh the church of the subgenius um that's as i mentioned what we what we love doing really is taking all of the ridiculous stuff that has been done in the name of the religion and uh, throwing it all together just to show how ridiculous it all is. Because regardless of whether you're a devout Christian or pagan or Protestant or Roman Catholic or Mormon or what or uh, Jewish or what have you, um, there has been a lot of stupid stuff done in the name of your religion. No matter who, yours, mine. Oh yeah, Islam too. I did. I and uh, I did not omit that intentionally. Um, and, but because of the, you know, because of all the stupid stuff that's been done. I mean, hey, look at televangelists, for instance. And yeah, I know the nine eleven attackers, or um, <clears throat> the, like even today, right now. I mean, you know, those televangelists uh, with the pandemic going on. You know, it's like they're sitting there waiting for this pandemic to end. So that they can get back to healing the sick. <laughs> so, um, which is why uh, we uh, make uh, we uh, come right out and, and announce that number one, we are in fact a crazy religious cult, and we are proud of it. Um, number two, we want money. Uh, the S Church of the Subgenius is is the world's first for-profit religion. We want profit. We are for-profit, and we are here to cast out. False prophets. Uh, I should also say that uh, membership in the Church of the Subgenius, a full ordainment and a lifetime membership, mind you, is thirty-five dollars. That means you make a thirty-five dollar donation to the uh, Church of the Subgenius, and they will send you a full ordainment kit, a membership pack with such things as a an actual printout of the of uh, the face of J.R. Bob Dobbs for you to do what you want with, an official uh, all-purpose divine excuse. Pretty much, this is what you need. You know, it's like uh, they don't offer uh, they don't offer the answers to life. What they do is they offer an excuse, so that um, no matter what you have done, you've got an excuse for it. And other uh, niceties like that. All of the details of that are, can be seen on the church's website, which is, of course, subgenius.com. Um, and this is another thing. It seems like whenever anybody throws one of these devivals and starts talking about the church of the subgenius, I have to say a couple of things. One, I am not Bob. Bob is the saint of sales. He is... Um, um, really, he is uh, the founder of the Church of the Subgenius, but I am not Bob. For some reason, people seem to think that. Not me personally, but anything, um, anyone who uh, tries talking about the Church of the Subgenius. Uh, number two, as I mentioned, they are a, pro a uh, for-profit uh, enterprise. Your donations, and you can buy a lot of great sacred, sacred swag from them, this T-shirt being only one example. Your donations will go to the Subgenius Foundation, Inc. I myself am not paid, paid for it. I get nothing from it. I am not, any kind, not getting any kind of commission or anything for saying like this. I joined the Church of the Subgenius because I wanted to, not because... Um, I was told to or anything. And in fact, uh, back in 1994, um, I discovered uh, one of the church's holy books, which was High Weirdness by Mail. And there was essentially what they did was they published a review of a whole bunch of crazy, crazy fringe groups that have been <clears throat> printing publications all across the country 
all across the country. You know, like those religious tracts you uh, pe that they hand out on the street or you find in uh, public restrooms or the like, or political groups who are, uh, you know, think of like the LaRouches, for instance, <laughs> or maybe the uh, <clears throat> the uh, Trump cult, or uh, the MAGA fanboys. <laughs> um the ones who really go out of their way to be obnoxious and stupid and embrace conspiracy theories. That's one thing I will gladly give the uh, Church of the Subgenius credit for. They have really, in they really taught me to be a good skeptic in that, uh, in that you really, you know what they say? Question everything. Why? Because uh, typically, when typically when you see those announcements on the on the internet that say you know you are asleep, they are out to control you. Usually, what that implies is that everybody else out there is uh, lying to you, except us. Follow our crazy ideas, our conspiracies, because we're telling you the truth. No, uh, you are not. Uh, pretty much anyone who says they offer you the truth, they are they're trying to sell you something including the Church of the Subgenius. The difference is we come right out and say it. And despite all this, I still haven't even gotten into the, to the details of that uh, great night that happened. However, before I get any further, let's check the chicken. No problem at all. This this batch of chicken is definitely done. So excuse me, I actually have another rack for the finished chicken. One second. We are off to a good start here. That is one huge size thigh. Like I miscounted. We not only have we don't have eight pieces, we have nine pieces. And there's still plenty of room in there too. Cool. Get this out of the way. Double check this oil again, and it says 278, 271. Good, I have time. Okay, from here, we got to start preparing ourselves another batch of chicken. And this is where I get to have some fun. As I mentioned already, this is the uh, breading that they uh, use at those pan fried chicken restaurants. It's completely self contained. I suppose you could mix it with flour, but you don't have to. After all, it's meant to be used in restaurants, so it should be as fast and convenient as possible. The instructions are uh, not rocket science either. You mix milk or water or buttermilk with the breading. Dredge the chicken in the in the uh, batter, then you dr then you dredge the chicken again in the dry, and you fry it. Da, 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 da. 
And I've had this chicken soaking all day in, well, curdled milk. Uh, buttermilk, as you know, is kind of expensive. Oops, let me see if I can move over this way, if at all possible. Um, as I mentioned, buttermilk is kind of expensive these days. Uh, however, it's much cheaper to make curdled milk, which has pretty much the same consistency as buttermilk. Uh, what you do is you simply take a uh, uh, half gallon of milk, mix in half a uh, half a gallon of vinegar, and then you just let it sit for about 20 minutes or so, and the milk will curdle, and it has the uh, consistency of buttermilk, and I find it just fine as a buttermilk substitute for frying, especially here, for instance. So we simply put a couple of pieces in here. And do you believe I'll be getting a life membership and go looking into that? Well, please do. Yes, as I mentioned, they do have a Wikipedia page, which tries to be neutral. And there is the Subgenius website as well, subgenius.com, which definitely does not try to be neutral. Well, why should they? After all, the conspiracy is not fair. Why should we be? It's out of the way. Shake and bake, literally, except we're not baking here, we're frying. Anyway, but yes, preparing fried chicken does take some effort because, you know, we've got to get all this stuff out. We have to get out the... Uh, we have to prepare the uh, chicken seasoning. We have to prepare the oil. We have to fry it. And then, of course, we have to be, try to make as little of a mess as possible. But is it all worth it? Well, you, well, you know the answer to that. Who doesn't like fried chicken? There's three pieces. Anyway, all we do is dredge this in the batter and drop it into the dry breading. Come on. What? Let's try this again. There we go. On top of everything else, uh, that as well, it's much cheaper to make your own chicken, too, of course. Because, I mean, when you consider how much these days does a 10-piece bucket of chicken cost you, just about anywhere, $15, $20? Um, I will say it probably cost me, like, about maybe $21 for this whole setup here. And I'm getting easily twice as much chicken and more than you can get at, at uh, any uh, fried chicken place. That, um, that gallon of peanut oil, for instance, cost about $11. Uh, this chip, the, um, for only about uh, maybe another $10 or so, I got um, 10, 10, yeah, that's right, 10 huge leg quarters, and I mean big. And each leg quarter, of course, you can cut into three pieces. So we're talking 30 pieces of chicken, although to be fair, I cut the uh, drumsticks and the thighs uh, off of the leg quarters. The third piece, which is like the backbone and all of the bony stuff, stuck that in all in the freezer because that, of course, is going to be stock for making stews and the like. Um, I apologize. I know I've got my back turned right now, so I, I'll check the comments in just a second. Uh, da, da, da. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Barberton, Ohio is the chicken capital of the world. Hmm. Sounds good here. Uh, and then the Midwest, too. We have Church's Chicken in, in the South. And the Midwest also. Oh, yeah, no. Crown Fried Chicken is certainly not the only one. However, it was really what opened my eyes and revealed that there are indeed alternatives to KFC because KFC, here's the thing. Uh, when I first eat KFC, I like it. 
And then I get tired of it at very quickly and find I would not want KFC for at least another month. <laughs> you know, far too greasy uh, and salty, too. Uh, this Crown Fried Chicken stuff, on the other hand, I could probably, uh, even though I shouldn't, I could probably eat this at least every week, if not more, because, you know, the, the consistency is different. And um, likewise, when you've got your Zaxby's and your churches and your Popeye's and I'm sure a lot of uh, home small down fried chicken uh, places as well. <laughs> oh, yeah. <clears throat> Crown fried chicken, of course. It's pretty well known for being in the, uh, shall we say, urban areas of the uh, <laughs> of the big city. And uh, I do happen to live in a uh, town that unfortunately does have something of an urban area. So I am actually, not only am I familiar with that, uh, there also are a few Crown Fried Chickens in my area. So I have actually had the chance to eat it at different locations. <laughs> yeah. Um, my, some of my favorites, there are two. Uh, there's one right across from City Hall, for instance, that does a pretty good job. Uh, let's see how this is uh, turning out by now. Oh, good. We are getting close once again, maybe just another few minutes or less, and we will be able to uh, fry this next batch. Anyway, I used to live in Boston. I still do live in, in the Boston area, so I know how that works. Devore's Hippocan Garden has overgrade, overtaken Belgrade Gardens. Amazon has the Texas breading. Yes, it does. In fact, I got that Texas breading from Amazon. <laughs> and yeah, I do have to admit, it is a little bit expensive. I mean, I'm doing this really because this is a special occasion for me, and so I splurged on it. There is no reason, of course, why you can't simply make your own chicken breading. You know how easy that is. I mean, technically, it could be just nothing more than uh, salt, pepper, garlic powder, paprika, and flour. Um, and again, there are many other uh, easy fried chicken breading recipes on the Internet. So uh, go and experiment. I mean, as you can see, it's really not that hard as long as you have the right tools for it, which again is a nice plug for cast iron. And what will you do with all of that chicken? Yeah, that's actually a tough question. I only live with my roommate. Um, I guess I'm gonna have to give a lot of this chicken to uh, my friends and family. Like for instance, you know, my BFF, who uh, is the mother of my godson, who I've mentioned a few times. I'm definitely gonna have to bring her some chicken, for instance. <laughs> I'm sure we. I'm sure we will find a use for all of this fried chicken. <laughs> you know how hard it is to get rid of fried chicken. <clears throat> um. Okay, I've talked a little bit about the Church of the Subgenius. As I mentioned, I traveled to New York City uh, with my uh, with panic and with uh, my girlfriend, and I experienced a lot of things for the first time. Uh, and uh, yeah, I definitely developed a love for New York City and that for that reason, Crown Fried Chicken being one of them. I had my very first genuine, um, real hardcore um, uh, Asian noodles there in New York City, udon noodles, um, much, much better than uh, the ramen noodle stuff, let me assure you. <laughs> so yeah, they definitely helped to open my eyes there. Um, <clears throat> uh, I had my first lox bagel, my, gen my first genuine New York lox bagel uh, there the next morning. So uh, yeah, as far as food goes, I learned, I discovered a lot of things in New York City. Uh, I have returned to the city for visits a few times. Each time has indeed been an adventure. <laughs> um, I can, I could go over it, but really it's, <clears throat> I'm, it's not really what I came here to talk about. As I mentioned already, this really has to do with saying how 10 years ago was this was such an exciting time and this and this was why I had to uh, make um, I had to make fried chicken here. Um, let's see how this chicken is let's see how this oil is. Um, we are just about there. We're just hitting 350 mark. Give me about one more minute or so.
And let's also check here. Do you eat the chicken plain or do you eat it with ketchup? Uh, I eat my chicken uh, nude because this breading is actually pretty darn good. Uh, I know some people have their chicken with ketchup. I never really got into that. Uh, I even have my fries uh, nude technically, uh, usually, so because I like the taste of potatoes. <laughs> Uh, Clay Gennard says Church of Bacon. Well, that's part of it, actually. We have several bacon uh, spinoffs from the church. You better believe that. Um, we ha There are quite a few celebrity members of the Church of the Subgenius. I'm talking real celebrities, too. People like uh, Penn Gillette, the magician. He is a well-known uh, fan of uh, Bob Dobbs. Uh, much of the church's viral popularity began because Robert Crumb, the artist, uh, discovered uh, the very earliest pamphlets from the church, published one of them in uh, one of his uh, many comic magazines, and that really helped uh, spur on the popularity of the uh, of the church. Uh, David Byrne, in fact, is also a member. He uh, did he did this documentary in the 1980s called True Stories. He did film a piece on the Church of the Subgenius, and then it was put on the cutting room floor, so it never made it made it into there. But yes, we've been around. Um, Reverend Stang has uh, hobnobbed with a number of, I guess you could call them underground rock stars. You know, people like Robert Anton Wilson, for instance. He was uh, a regular, uh, regular uh, with them. Uh, Reverend Stang is also one of the managers as well of the Starwood Festival, which is a really one of the largest pagan festivals in the country. It takes place in Ohio uh, every summer. Except this one, you know, because of what happened. Um, and as I mentioned, it was Reverend Stang, really, who helped open my eyes to things like conspiracy theories, which has, uh, has indeed been <clears throat> uh, really an important part as I have seeing that there is, quite frankly, a lot of stupidity in the world around me. And even if I can't do very much about it, I really am glad to be able to laugh at it. And at this point, I think we're ready to put in the chicken for batch number two. Two... Three. Oh, I only did six pieces. Okay, I better quickly do a couple more. Four. Five. Six. Now I better quickly uh, throw a couple more in there. Oh, yeah. Another longtime member of the Church of the Subgenius, Pee Wee Herman. He was one of the earliest members, in fact. Although, as Reverend Stang likes to say, you know, Pee Wee Herman is a member, but he still owes us $10. However, he has, of course, given us exposure. And, in fact, if you remember Pee Wee's Playhouse, the te that Saturday morning TV show, Bob appeared on Pee-wee's Playhouse. Pee-wee actually put the face of Bob in the background of Pee-wee's Playhouse, and you'll see it in just about any episode of that show, if you remember that. That's just one of the examples. Bob's face was also on that Sublime album, the one 40 Ounces to Freedom. Um, Stang actually had to complain to the record company, and they paid him a couple of grand for that. <laughs> But yes, that is him there on that album. Uh, he has a cameo appearance in the famous cult film, The Wizard of Speed and Time. And there are quite a few other places where Bob's image has shown up as well. So yes, Bob gets around. Now, seven and eight. Okay. Hey. Hi, everyone. Ray Mulan. Well, hi. Nice to see you. Uh, Cookie G, I listen to Penn Gillette's podcast all the time. Well, I'm certain he's mentioned us 
R. Crumb, Underground Comics. Yes, that R. Crumb. Still have some. Uh, he lives in France or did he pass? Uh, he lives in France, and as far as I know, he's still alive. Um, if Even though it is now, oh, man, 30 years old? <laughs> If you haven't seen that wonderful and really, really strange documentary, Crumb, on Artist R. Crumb, you definitely need to give that a try. That is really, I mean, that will make your jaw drop. I used to watch Pee Wee's Playhouse on YouTube just because you know you can't see it anywhere else. Well, yeah, and besides, everything's on YouTube these days, and I mean everything. Hmm. Hmm. Oh, so far so good. And this is going to help keep up the seasoning in this cast iron as well. I mean, really, if you want to uh, keep your cast iron uh, fresh, deep fry something in it. And, you, and you, there are really few better ways to uh, keep your uh, cast iron uh, just that uh, well seasoned. So <clears throat> where was I? We traveled to New York City, as I mentioned. Um, the, I, in the link, or rather in the uh, description of this video, wow, we're at 50 minutes already, nice. <laughs> in the description of this video, I uh, mentioned, um, I included a link to Reverend Stang's uh, description of the New York revival, for instance. He only mentioned one small part of it, but he got to hobnob with all of the stars, the organizers, the folks in uh, New York City, who, went, who organized it, the, like the GFY clinch, for instance. And yeah, GFY is exactly what you think it means. <laughs> Profanity is uh, really an important part of this church. YouTube, on the other hand, does not like profanity, which is why I am not going to indulge in it here. <laughs> um, as I mentioned, we stayed at that hotel. We dressed up in Ren Faire outfits. And yeah, it was at about, really at about this time of night, between 9 and 10 o'clock, we, we uh, got in the cab and uh, headed out to the uh, Great Divival, which, thank goodness, had a packed house. Uh, that Really, that was pretty much a miracle, and that's why it's considered one of the great subgenius divivals of history, in that they sold the place out. And uh, really, for something as obscure as the Church of the Subgenius, that was pretty good. We had uh, some really great uh, music, too. We had DJ Two Beans. He loves his dubstep. We had uh, Fat Nandy, a uh, performance artist it's, who's really, it's hard to hard to describe uh let's just say that she climaxes her number by literally sticking her entire fist her entire fist into her mouth and seeing the star spangled banner with her fist in, in her mouth that's only one small part of it then there's her husband tommy amoeba who is uh literally eaten by worms on stage Oh, yeah, it gets pretty darn strange, and I am not even uh, scratching the surface of this. So that's why, as I said, in some ways, you, uh, if you're not careful, you may consider this to be offensive. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, from there, then from there, as I mentioned, our uh, dear friends... Reverend uh, Gigglepuss and Reverend 808, they actually uh, came to this especially to get married. Um, they have been regulars and good friends at the regular X-Day drills that take place every year. That's, that happens on the weekend of July 5th as we, wait for the, uh, as we wait for the excess flying saucers to come and destroy the world. Okay, now here's one of the confessions, and because this is one of the most important part, parts of the Church of the Subgenius, and that is X Day. You see, at about 7 a.m. on July 5th, will, the men from Planet X will come down in their uh, flying saucers, especially to rupture the, uh, the full paid-up Subgenius ministers and take them away into the escape vessels of the sex goddesses. And believe me, no, I did not make that up. That is an important part of church scripture. You will see that on the website. You will see that on Wikipedia. Um, essentially, the idea is just that. You know how they say religion, uh, really one of the selling points of any major religion, it's really not so much the uh, idea of salvation. It's more like the idea that everybody else is going to burn in hell. 
except for us. We are the chosen ones. And that's the whole point here. We are the chosen ones. If you have not paid your $35 to Jarrah Bob Dobbs, then on July 5th, you better believe you're going to burn. But wait a second. July 5th is coming past and come and gone, hasn't it? Well, it's obviously not the right July 5th. July 5th, 1998, to be precise. That is when the uh, flying, that is when the excess will arrive and Bob will be there to uh, greet them. He will be there to greet us, actually. For quite a few years, I uh, traveled to Ohio or New York as well, especially to uh, take part in X Day. And um, that's where we have ourselves pretty much a, uh, it takes place in an outdoor campground. Uh, where we can uh, pretty much party and do anything we want uh, until the uh, cr until the uh, pro until the sacred moment when the uh, saucers arrive. Oh, hi there! Oh boy, I better get you away. Excuse me, please. I'm frying oil here. We don't want him to to be hurt. Okay. Wow. <laughs> he just crawled up on my leg. <laughs> Not bad. He's only uh, lived here for, uh, well, as a matter of fact, this is his one month anniversary, sort of. After one week of, uh, you know, getting, of uh, actually uh, keeping him in the bedroom, one month ago on September 10th, in fact, we opened up the bedroom and let the kittens uh, prowl through the whole house. And he has really uh, gotten himself... <laughs> Well, he's really become quite the troublemaker. In fact, from day one, we named him Trouble for that reason, because he is Trouble with a capital T. <laughs> How avant-garde. What part of Ohio? Well, it takes place at Wisteria, which is an outdoor campground in Pomeroy, Ohio. <laughs> is that a bobcat? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh. If only. Um, I'm not sure, to be honest. I mean, I don't think he even has the mark of a tabby. So, But he's a beautiful black short hair. Very sleek and very svelte. Hmm. Hmm. Oh, this chicken is turning out pretty good. Um, as I said, if anybody else, uh, feel free to uh, comment in as well. I mean, you know, you can uh, pretty much ask questions if you'd like about... Bob about um, cast iron as always I mean as you know I've been doing the all of these uh, live chats here hold on I better make sure he doesn't try he doesn't pull out my ethernet cord okay no he's doing good <laughs> and I'm not sure yet give it about one more minute I think before I flip over the chicken for this next batch <laughs> So that, that will be 16 pieces of chicken and counting. So we are uh, doing pretty good here. <clears throat> oh, great. Now he is moving the camera. How nice. Excuse me once again. I'm very sorry for the interruption. Again, my apologies for the interruption. <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, well, if you want, I can put him back in there if that's okay. Okay, one moment. Sorry again for the delay. I really apologize for this. <laughs> so anyway, um, yeah, as I mentioned now, the Church of the Subgenius, again, this was, uh, I mentioned already, I joined them back in uh, 1994. 
before. And I was really, really heavily involved with them, easily as much as I am with <laughs> cooking now. Um, one of the things that happened in 2010, as I mentioned, was that I kind of caught the cooking bug. Well, not kind of. I did catch the cooking bug. And uh, due to uh, other... Um, if, Oops, sorry. Due to other events that uh, happened a little later in 2011, I ended up leaving the Church of the Subgenius uh, for several years, in fact. But I'm glad to say that at least I've got one good thing to say about 2020, and that's when I got myself reacquainted with a, a lot of good friends and uh, people who I've really missed. So I'm very, very glad to be able to uh, do this. And I do hope a number of them are watching or will be watching at some point and commenting on the uh, on the uh, video. Looking forward to it. Oh, dear. The coating seems to be coming off. Oh, well. So it goes. It'll still be some good fried chicken. <laughs> Do you ever use a cast iron pan for smaller batches of chicken instead of the large fish pan? Ever deep fry in a Dutch oven? Oh, definitely. That's one of the best things you can do with a Dutch oven. I mean, granted, you know, your typical number eight size Dutch oven, which is about 10 inches across, I'd say you could probably only deep fry maybe three pieces at a time at the most. But hey, then again, I mean, not everybody is going to eat like 20 pieces of chicken here. <laughs> so, yes, I mean, the, a Dutch oven is great for many things. Cooking, uh, well, obviously cooking. I meant baking, um, roasting, braising, and deep frying. I very highly recommend it. You don't want, um, which is why I've said before, really, um, you know, they say every kitchen needs a uh, three things, and that would be a good chef's knife, a stock pot for boiling the water, and a cast iron skillet. After you've gotten yourself a cast iron skillet, I would recommend probably in a bare iron Dutch oven as the next piece of cast iron to get. Um, a, an enamel Dutch oven works great, and it has a lot of advantages as well. And yes, I do recommend that if you are, if you so feel like it. But uh, for your first choice for a Dutch oven, I would recommend a bare iron uh, pot first, as I do feel you can actually get more use out of it than an enamel Dutch oven. Get the enamel Dutch oven after that for making things with tomatoes, like uh, tomato sauce, pasta sauce, stews, um, and the like. Hmm. Um, we uh, we sub. Oh yeah, not come. Oh yeah, I should have recognized your name. I apologize for that. We sub genii have been watching from Tap House Cabal on IRC. Good stuff so far. Praise Bob. Praise Bob. And give my uh, welcomes and my blessings to the uh, yeah to the Tap House. Um, I'm betting that all of the regulars are probably still there. Every time I go to Tap House, it's like there are about uh, 25 lurkers and maybe one person actually uh, posting. But, yes, I'm glad to see. Uh, Raymond, what's the oil temperature? Okay, I'll uh, repeat that I'm using peanut oil here, and I bring the peanut oil to 375 degrees before putting the chicken into it. I know the typical uh, deep frying temperature, they say, is 350. I go a little bit above, maybe 365 to 375, because when you put the chicken in, it causes a real sharp drop in the oil's temperature. And so if the oil is a little, a little above 350, then the uh, temperature drop will not be quite as steep. As I mean, it didn't take too long, for instance, for the oil to uh, heat back up to frying temperature here. Clay Gennard, oh no, I think we're all enjoying your monologue. Well, well, well again, all I can say is thank you there. Uh, Jonathan Shopper, isn't there always tomato paste in stews besides frying and soup? What are bare cast iron Dutch ovens best for? Oh, man. <laughs> uh, roasting. Uh, I, if you look on my YouTube channel, you can see I have a separate category just for chicken dishes. And quite a few of them are uh, done in a Dutch oven. I've got this really, really fun 
fast method where you can make the best roast chicken you've probably ever made in a bare cast iron Dutch oven. And it's done lightning fast too. In only about 45 minutes, you can take a five pound chicken and completely have it cooked to uh, a wonderful degree. Um, the trick is heating the whole thing, including the lid up to 500 degrees. And then you drop the, uh, you drop the chicken into it carefully and roast the whole chicken at 500 degrees for 45 minutes. Take a look at the video and you'll see. Another of my favorites is uh, Dutch oven chicken and rice. That's where we uh, cook together. Well, just that, your favorite chicken and a whole bunch of rice. And boy, do, does that come out good. And then, of course, there are classic chicken dishes as well, like, say, coca vin, for instance. Um, you know, chicken braised in wine. And then from there, again, you can use this for deep frying, as I mentioned. Um it's well, um, I even do use it as a stock pot on the stovetop in that every once in a while I take my bare Dutch oven and boil things in it. For instance, I met, my favorite mashed potato dish is uh, made in a uh, bare iron pot. Um, Semper Fi 1918, what's your favorite cast iron piece? All of them. <laughs> um, I, no, I really can't say favorite, although I do have a few users that I do use in my kitchen almost all the time. Um, one would be my Birmingham Stove and Range Red Mountain number 8 skillet. Basically, that is a 10-inch diameter cast iron skillet that was made somewhere between the 1940s and the 1960s. And then there is my Griswold Dutch oven, as I mentioned. Uh, not to mention a um, Birmingham Stove and Range shallow fish fryer, which is uh, the length of two burners here, but much less deep. For, um, and, oh, and then definitely is my 14-inch cast iron wok. I love doing stir fries in my lodge wok. So um, it's hard to say, really, because it really depends on what you feel like. VLXX. X, it's very hard to interact with or affect the seasoning. Just cook with it. No need to avoid any dishes. Pretty much, yes. You can make tomato dishes in a bare past cast iron pot once in a while. Tomatoes will affect the seasoning, but if you have a well seasoned cast iron pot, that's not a problem. You can, you know, you can just uh, cook regular dishes after that, and uh, then uh, that will help build up the seasoning there. Do you use the trivet in the Dutch oven? Once in a while, depending on what what you're making, I find most of the time I actually don't. Uh, if you're doing chicken in a Dutch oven, I prefer doing a vegetable tri uh, trivet. You know, you chop up big hunks of carrots and potatoes and uh, onions, and you just lay a bed of them on the uh, on the uh, floor of the Dutch oven and put the chicken on top of that because then you can eat it afterwards. Um, Andrew Bonificio, chicken, beef, pork. You need not apologize. Well, <laughs> it's all part of the programming. Well, yes, indeed. Um, I'm not apologizing. And that's why, um, even though I know I have gotten a couple of people uh, upset because sometimes I do talk about things other than cooking. That's because, well, again, I've said from the beginning, this is my channel and, I'm, and it's really more about myself. Uh, yeah, cooking is a very important hobby for me, and I'm, that's why I've dedicated a large part of my channel to uh, that. But every so often, I do get the uh, urge to uh, do a video on a, on other topics, like this one, for instance, where here I am talking about a religious cult, one that actually has gotten into trouble once in a while. I mean, I could tell the story of the 1999 Boston revival, where the city of Cambridge actually sent the police to shut us down because they thought we were in uh, had something to do with the Columbine High School massacre. No, we did not. We had absolutely nothing to do with that. Uh, let's see how this chicken is right now. Almost, not quite. Give it about another couple of minutes. Getting close. Gotta have patience. 
as always when cooking, that's the other thing. Patience is very, very important. <laughs> yes, I make arroz con, uh, con polo in my cast iron pan, not Dutch oven yet. But it always strips away some seasoning. A quick scorch in the oven with some canola oil, canola oil brings it right back. Oh, yes. Yes, that's um, Dutch oven uh, chicken and rice. Definitely. Mm. The nice thing about making rice in that manner especially is that when you end up with the pagao, that's when, yeah, as you know, that's that crust of caramelized rice on the sides and the bottom of the pan, which may be even better than the chicken itself. Although this chicken is pretty darn good, and I'm definitely looking forward to this. <laughs> All right, let's check this one more time. Wow. Okay. Yeah, I think we are. I think we're done here. <laughs> nice thing about dark meat, of course, as you know, it, it doesn't dry out, and it's probably even more tender that way. We are definitely good here. Like a couple of extra crisps too. That's a bonus, if anything. And as you can see, these are pretty big pieces of chicken too. They're not small. And we're still not done yet. Got one last batch to go. I think. Um, I mean, of course. battery case on this came off and of course anybody is free to come and go as they please so i'm good. so i'm probably just going to keep going if, um if, if nobody minds anyway um let's see here how can i do this okay i'm gonna have to transfer this yeah my apologies for the delay gotta be as quick as i can here Once again, I appreciate your patience, folks. I'm sorry for those little interruptions. Having done that, we are down to the last few pieces of chicken, of course. Dredge this in the batter. Oh, yeah, and this is some good stuff, too. Nice and spicy, but not too spicy. And after that, we'll put it in with the breading. And we shake it up. as well on the passing of Eddie Van Halen.
I like those racks. Never seen one with a stand like that. Um, those racks, I think I just got them at a uh, at a Chinese market. Those I love browsing in those places because they have all of these kinds of uh, kitchen gadgets that, well, you never knew you needed. <laughs> and that's one of them. So, yeah, very, very useful. skin too. <laughs> wow, I think I actually have more chicken here than I planned. Oh well, that's not so bad. Let's see as if there's such a thing as too much chicken. Although as I mentioned, I am going to have to give this away to like friends and family and the like. this is the part that your kids will want to do, shake the chicken. And there's no reason not to, as long as they hold this nice and tight. I have a 10 inch Wagner ware I inherited from my mother. It has the silver fake chrome finish. Any way to date that? And is that a common skillet? Um, those chrome plated ones or nickel plated either way. Um, I cannot say they're rare. They're actually, oh, as far as antiques go, they're probably not too hard to find. Um, Finding one in pristine condition, on the other hand, is very difficult because, as you know, that chrome or that nickel wore off pretty fast, and then it was um, all you had left. Then was really a little bit of the um, a little bit of the chrome and a whole bunch of uh, bare iron underneath, and that did not look very uh, appealing. Regrettably, it still cooks just great, which I'm sure you do. Uh, as for dating it, it would be the same as the uh, as any other uh, Wagner ware, in that you can tell whether or not it has a uh, bottom with a heat ring or not, or if it uh, has, or if it actually says something like "Made in USA." But I'm betting it doesn't. I think they stopped doing those chrome-plated ones probably by the 1940s at the very latest. And. Good. I think we're about the last piece of chicken here. No, last two pieces of chicken. <laughs> Even so, uh, buffering. Uh-oh. Oh, I see. I am still on an Ethernet connection. Um, okay, it's well loved, but was taken care of for a daily user. Thank you. Well, that's good. And best I could say is please continue getting some good use out of it. I mean, that's really the best thing to do with cast iron. I try not to be a collector. I try to get as much use out of all my pans as I possibly can, <laughs> which is one reason why I do this channel, because it gives me an excuse to keep rotating through all of the different pans in my collection. 
which certainly helps. Like this cast iron fish fryer, for instance. I mean, after all, as I mentioned, I live by myself. I do have a roommate, but still, between the two of us, how, how many opportunities do we have to bring out a big, huge fish fryer like this? Which is why I'm more, that's one of the reasons why I'm glad to be able to do this here. Because, as I said already, um, <laughs> this is, um, right now it's like I'm celebrating uh, the way my life changed 10 years ago. And yes, I have been having a lot of fun all since then. <laughs> Which I guess is why I'm, even though I have returned to the Church of the Subgenius, I am not going to devote my entire life to Bob. I killed Bob back in uh, 2011, and uh, that means I was free, really, to uh, go my own way. And I like to think that I have. On the other hand, there's no reason not to associate with some really good friends who I very much appreciate, uh, you know, seeing, seeing them again and seeing you, all, seeing all of you here. This is going to be a little messy. Actually, I better double check that temperature first. My bad. 356, 350. All right. Yeah, that's good. Okay, give me about one more minute or so. <laughs> anyway, I just barely gave a, a very brief description of the events of what happened that night on... Uh, December, no, October 10th of 2010. Once again, the date was 10, 10, 10. <laughs> it was one, only one of a number of uh, events that uh, were occurring to me at that time, and I'm looking fondly back on it. And that's really, again, was my intention for uh, having this having this little mini devival, I guess you could call it tonight. So, <laughs> It has your attitude about cooking, food and cooking changed since the coronavirus? Mm, no. I, the coronavirus has affected a lot of things, yes. Most importantly, sadly, is that this coming Thanksgiving, there are going to be many, many empty spaces at the table all across the country. That, I feel, is first and foremost, that so many people have tragically and needlessly passed away, or I guess I should say died due to, uh, due to this pandemic. That is a, uh, uh, well, as you know, that's a very sad subject and one that everybody's been talking about pretty much nonstop. I'm not going to uh, go any really more into that. But as far as food and cooking is concerned, well, I don't see how it's had any real effect. I mean, granted, yes, it has changed restaurants and the way they do business and so Many of them have closed, but as far as if ind individual cooking for family goes, um, I would say really there should not be any reason to change it. There we go. After all, you know, what we've been eating and cooking, unfortunately, like it or not, has had very little to do with the pandemic. Sorry. It's had very little to do with the pandemic. Better move a little more slowly. Good at this point. So 
Okay, there's no reason why I couldn't just put some of this stuff in the batter and make some hush puppies to go with it. Very spicy hush puppies, I will admit. After all, why waste this stuff? Besides the fact that it's a bit expensive, as those who looked on Amazon saw, it's also, as I mentioned, very spicy and, yeah, very tasty, too. Give it a little bit of that carefully. The other thing, of course, about frying is that, unfortunately, it does make a big mess. There's almost no way around that. But, fortunately, I'm not going to do a YouTube Live of cleaning up after this. <laughs> That's my business. Uh, Glock J, would you recommend soaking a vintage pen in vinegar to remove the surface rust? Yes, you can do that, uh, briefly. Here's where I actually disagree with the advice of the cast iron cooking group in that for safety reasons, I guess, really safety of the pan, that is, they often recommend soaking a pan in vinegar for only about 30 minutes at a time. I don't think it's that bad. Uh, I could probably go with, like, say, an overnight soak in vinegar at least, and that would do a great job of uh, removing surface rust. You might even want to just take your pan to the sink and scrub it, in fact. Um first step would be definitely to strip off the seasoning, though. I'm, my favorite method is using a lye tank. A lot of people use electrolysis or even the oven cleaner in the bag. Once the pan has been stripped to the bare metal, then it's necessary to uh, remove the surface rust because, um, well, um, lye does not remove rust. And there's a little bit on here that I need to get under the surface carefully. Hmm. Uh, COVID has really kicked up my cooking uh, game. I really wish I could share it, though. Well, then, that's at least one of the few good things about this quarantine, in that a lot of people have uh, really rediscovered home cooking, and that is nice. In a way, I guess, uh, cast iron, is, well, I mean, cast iron's made a real resurgence in popularity over the last, uh, probably the last decade or so, but this, well, may has helped in that respect. Um, quite a cost, of course, but yeah, again, we'll talk about that some, some other time. Hmm. Um, would you recommend, uh, deep fried breading? The best part of the chicken. I will not disagree there. Semper Fi 1918. I'm cooking steak and eggs every day. Mm hmm. Watch that cholesterol. Me too. Of course. I've got to watch my cholesterol. I've unfortunately uh, put on more weight during this pandemic than I really like. And I'm going to have to take care of that very soon. <laughs> that is one of the joking things we see on the Cast Iron Cooking Group. A lot of these people are saying things like, you know, thanks to you, I've gained 600 pounds. <laughs> yeah, and we actually don't deny that. <laughs> hmm. Is there a recipe you haven't done yet you want to try next? There are many recipes I have not tried yet. There are so many. As I mentioned, I've been cooking for just about 10 years now, and I have been trying a lot of recipes, but there is so, so much out there. Even some basic things that you would uh, be surprised about, like chicken fried steak, for instance. I have never had the chance to make chicken fried steak. I'm going to have to, I'm going to have to do that. Uh, one of these days. Um, and yeah, that could very well be the subject of a video. But there, um, somebody says, the audio is fine when the mic is stationed on the counter. No need to hold the mic. Everything, okay. So you're saying that it's uh, fine like this. Okay. All right. Well, then that's fine. I don't want to uh, over, overwhelm the audio. Pandemic pounds, yeah. Uh, one cute meme I saw about that. You know, a panda will eat uh, about 12 hours every day. This is the same as a person at home on quarantine, and that's why they call it a pandemic. Oops. Oh, 
All right. Um, I've mentioned already, as I said, some a few of the points of the uh, Church of the Subgenius, and yet, strangely enough, people have not fled this channel in droves, and <laughs> I thank you for that very, very much. Um, as I mentioned, that is something that was a uh, big part of my life. Now, if, at least if nothing else, I'm still associating with friends again. I'm very happy about that. There is a lot of literature on the Church of the Subgenius, both offline and online. As I mentioned, there is a major feature-length documentary coming out. Uh, in only 10 days, the official release of that is October 20th. That is just a coincidence. I'm not doing this especially because of that. I'm doing this, as I mentioned already, to celebrate October 10th. Next one of these personal ones is almost certainly going to be around uh, the early to midpoint of November. Um, I do have plans, as I mentioned already, within about two weeks or so to bring out the big 15-gallon cast iron cauldron because Halloween is coming, and that is a really good excuse to do some cauldron magic. <laughs> Something I haven't gotten into uh, very much. I've touched it once or twice, and that's the subject of magic. But that is an entirely different subject, which I guess I'll come out at some other point. And besides, didn't, didn't I say that I was proud to be a skeptic? Absolutely. And uh, I very much love the contradiction of that. <laughs> Um, keep slap that, oh, like, like that, no, again, thank you so much, yeah. oh, sorry, it should still be pointed in your direction, I <laughs> can't hear you, my very much, I, my apologies for that, everyone, <laughs> <laughs> nonetheless, though, I mean, as I said, I am uh, still quite happy of how all this chicken turned out, and yeah, I'm definitely looking forward to chowing down on that. <laughs> Will you buy a pumpkin for Halloween? Will you try cooking something with it? Oh, definitely, yes. Um, I love making pumpkin pies. I also like making stuffed pumpkins. That's one thing I've mentioned pretty much every year around this time. You know, I'm actually kind of disappointed, not with anybody personally here, but with in general, pumpkins are seen for only two things. Pumpkin pie and jack-o'-lanterns, and that's it. Pumpkin is a squash, and it's a very delicious squash, and you can really make many, many things with pumpkin. I mean, just use it as a substitute in a squash dish, just as a very simple suggestion. I mean, especially these days, pumpkin is so cheap. You know, for like five bucks or less, you can get yourself a gigantic uh, jack-o'-lantern pumpkin. Also, there, as you know, you've got the smaller pie pumpkins and the big jack-o'-lantern pumpkins. There is nothing wrong with eating a jack-o'-lantern pumpkin. It will st you can still eat it just fine. And um, you get one of those and you chop it up. And boy, have you got a lot of squash available for quite a few squash dishes. Uh, if you look on my channel, I've got this uh, video I did a few years ago called Pumpkin Stew. That was pretty much an all afternoon project. But I was very proud of that in which I cooked a uh, big pumpkin full of uh, curry chicken and vegetables. And that turned out very nummy indeed. And then, of course, this pumpkin pie. One of my very first videos, in fact, I think that thing might be like about seven or eight years old, was my uh, video on cast iron pumpkin pie. And I'm still quite proud of that recipe. And it is so much better than your typical uh, pie that you can uh, buy at the store. And as always, uh, if you'd like to give it a try, please feel free. No more audio. No more audio. Okay. Hmm. All right. Oh, I see why. No, I don't. Test, test, test. Audio, audio. I can hear. Oh, okay. Cecil the Lion. Regrettably, that might only be your uh, audio. I'm sorry to say. <laughs> Just trying to help free up your hands. Don't worry about that. Okay. All right. Not, not to worry. <laughs> Hmm. But yeah, we are definitely getting into that time of the year where it's time to start some, some special holiday cooking. Uh, another one I'll plug for my channel, uh, and this is one uh, another one I'm proud of, um, and that is chocolate chip pumpkin spice cake. 
And that is where you take uh, actual pumpkin and you make a cake out of it with using pumpkin spice. And it's uh, really nummy. I know people are sick and tired of pumpkin spice and everything. Well, this is, in fact, a uh, recipe that should that you that pumpkin spice was made for and uh really there's nothing to regret about that pumpkin spice is delicious i know it's only oversaturated because do we really need pumpkin spice chips and popcorn and um, dog food and uh, probably not so <laughs> but nonetheless there's a place for everything even pumpkin spice <laughs> i hear fine okay thank you so much and I guess I'll also give a shout out again for my friends in the Church of the Subgenius who I'm hoping it would be nice if they're watching this video live, but it's not essential. I mean, after all, it's a Saturday night. Uh, it is, oh man, 1036 on a Saturday night. I mean, I really don't see, um, uh, I don't insist that anybody stay home just to watch a YouTube live video by somebody like me. I mean, obviously, if you have a chance to go out partying, carefully in this pandemic if you have a chance to go out on a saturday night please do so because you know the this video is going to be available on my channel after it's all over and they will be more than happy and yeah i very much encourage everyone really to just comment on it and feel free to make comments and ask questions about cast iron ask questions about bob feel free to insult me uh, as a couple of the trolls on the channel have done so. Um, as far as trolls go, my channel ha seems to have a lot fewer trolls than some. Maybe that's because I've only made a few political comments. Um, but, well, the ones that I have have attracted uh, some trolls, but that's, that's fine. I enjoy playing with trolls. As I mentioned already, I've seen a lot of conspiracy theories thanks to the Church of the Subgenius, and that has definitely opened my eyes in many ways. Number one being is that no group at all is uh, exclusive to our conspiracy theories. You've got your right-wing gun nut conspiracies. You've got your left-wing um, uh, save-the-earth conspiracies. And, oh, God, is there a lot of that, especially when it comes to food and cooking. You've got your religious conspiracies. You've got your... Uh, political conspiracies and oh, yeah yeah and go on and on as i mentioned just now yes including foodie conspiracies <laughs> do you ever cook with shallots um not very often usually i do just use onions um i know i know shallots are not the same as onions and they do in fact have a sweeter taste uh, maybe it's because i like onions um I don't find shallots to be essential, but that's just me. I'm sure some other people would say, how dare you? Shallots are an important part of life, and that's fine. I mean, as I said, every, each everybody has their uh, own tastes. <laughs> Can cast iron be repaired if it has a hairline crack? Some say yes. What say you? Yes, it can be repaired, but it's not easy. Welding cast iron and repairing it is a pretty tricky job, and a lot of welders and uh, repair shops will not do it because cast iron is so brittle, and it's too. And it's often they could end up just simply breaking it or damaging it even more as they try to repair it. So it can be done, but the cost would be at a point where it would be much cheaper and convenient to simply buy a new pan. I know. What if it's a uh, prized family heirloom? Well, if you want to make the expense and have a professional weld it together, then, of course, please feel free to do so. I do have two pans that I took the time to weld, both of which or have welded. I didn't weld them. Uh, both of which are uh, gate-marked 19th century skillets, and both of which technically are, were considered disposable skillets. Number one is my lucky number seven, which I use for cornbread. Number two is my number nine size fancy handle pan. That one there, in fact, is the lightest and thinnest cast iron pan of that size I've ever held. And it was especially because it's so light that when I when I bought it at Brimfield, I found out it had not one but two cracks on it. I didn't want to get rid of it, and I took the time to have it uh, welded by a professional, and I do enjoy it. 
Uh, a hairline crack, on the other hand, is still dangerous in that it can expand when your pan is heated. So I do not recommend cooking in a pan with a hairline crack. Better to get a new pan in that case. As VLXXX says, there's no way to trust the repair, and welding cast iron is not cheap, exactly as he says. I made your apple pie you, to you uh, posted last week with Crown Royal Apple. Turned out great. Oh, well, thank you again. Thank you very, very much. Yeah, that apple pie recipe is one of a number that I am proud to call my own because it's kind of like a variation on apple pie. I think I can flip this by now. Um, it's not your typical uh, apple pie recipe that you see, that you, uh, see uh, everywhere else. It's a little different. The taste is a little different, but I am very, uh, I'm, I like it a lot, and I'm quite proud of it. Hmm. Starting to get dark stuff on the bottom in some cases. Well, I just better be careful. And yeah, I'd say probably when this batch of chicken is done, I think we will be done. After all, we've been going here, wow, for an hour and 40 minutes. Thank you very much for everybody who has actually bothered staying all of this time. I mean, I'm, I am honestly no kidding. I am very flattered and very grateful. It's, um, as I said, I have a lot of fun doing this, and it really, really makes me feel good to know that people are watching and, I guess, enjoying themselves. <laughs> What are welding, no, are welding flux materials safe for cooking? Probably not. Uh, what they use usually are nickel welds to uh, repair uh, food safe cast iron. I'm not a professional. I don't know all the details, but I believe it's usually done with nickel. Do you ever bake with a small cast iron pan in a toaster oven? Oh, yes. I don't have a small toaster oven. I've got a uh, nice size convection oven. Um, which was a gift from my mom. <laughs> and uh, not only do I cook stuff in it, my roommate loves using that thing. So yes, uh, cooking with a toaster oven is great, assuming you've got a pan that will fit in there, that is, because as you know, those things are, like you said, pretty small. But uh, nonetheless, if you've got one that fits, go ahead and use it. If you use the right welding rod, it should be fine. Wife's made two pear pies. Turned out fantastic. Highly recommend. Oh, yeah, that's a pear pie. Oh, that sounds good. <laughs> Definitely going to have to try that. I would think with a pear pie, as much as I love pears, you would probably want something for a spice in the background. Not necessarily cinnamon because, you know, you don't want to overwhelm it with cinnamon and make it taste like everything else, but something to give it more of a, a touch, like maybe ginger or cardamom, for instance. <laughs> We are a Saturday night. Oh, they, yeah. <laughs> yeah, the kissing comes later. Thank you. <laughs> I wonder if you could fill a hairline crack with gold. Well, gold is a very soft metal, and relatively speaking, it has a low melting point. I, I'm no metallurgist, but I'm sure someone would tell you that the melting point of gold is probably a, a lot less than cast iron. Um, I'm not even sure if it's safe to cook with it for that reason. Hmm. I know somebody mentioned, when I mentioned, no, when Lodge came out with the Made in America pan and the ones that had the uh, pictures of, uh, of Lincoln on it, somebody again mentioned, well, gee, we should have one with a picture of Trump on it. Oh, good grief. And my comment then and now is that Trump would only be satisfied with a uh, skillet made of solid gold with his face on it. It would be gaudy. It would be worthless because, as I mentioned, I mean, really, I'm not even sure if you could cook with it. And if you could cook with it, it would not cook with any more than any other kind of a cast iron pan. And also, it would definitely be out of the reach of us commoners. <laughs> Okay, I'll stop talking about Trump. I'll leave that for, an, for another time. Uh, if you have an email, I could send you a great recipe for pear pie that my wife makes. Oh, I'm looking forward to it. Yes. Uh, okay. Um, Trump, no. <clears throat> if, the, if the Trump crap continues, you are out of here. This is not the place for it. I'm, I am going to say something when election day comes, but not until then. Hmm. 
All right. Um, I have a Victor number nine and number nine Grizz slant with hairline crack. So there we go. Okay. Um, well, all I can say is my condolences to that. I mean, if you'd like, if you do have the resources to have them uh, welded, well, you can certainly give it a try, and they will likely then be able to cook for many more years. You brought it up. Yes, and it's my channel. Thank you very much. Here's hoping Trump is goes down in a landslide on election day. So there. <laughs> Praise Bob. Definitely. Uh, Nuff, Nuff case. Okay, yeah, there is a subject I would much rather talk about, and that, of course, would be Bob. After all, Bob came about in the Reagan era. And yes, we lived through the Reagan era somehow. So uh, we are actually quite familiar with uh, political satire. And for good reason. I mean, believe me, with all of the stupid things that happens in the name of politics, I mean, it's like, who? I'm, I would think as well that now would really be a good time for Bob to uh, make a comeback. Uh, let's check this uh, kit. Let's check this chicken before uh, things get too awkward. Uh, now we are good here. So far, so good. I think that means I can turn off the heat. Because I'm pleased to say this chicken is done. We even have a couple of little hush puppies to go with it. Nonetheless, uh, despite my jumping from subject to subject, and even though I really didn't even get into a lot of detail, it's largely because, as I mentioned, I have a lot of great memories of that night of October 10th, 2010. And as such, I'm very glad to uh, be able to celebrate the 10th anniversary of that uh, sacred event. Giggle Puss and um, 808 are still married, and they are celebrating their 10th anniversary tonight, in fact. Which is why they're not here, because after all, on a Saturday night, I'm sure you would want to spend your... Uh, wedding anniversary doing something exciting and I know they are they are a very inventive and creative couple nonetheless I would say mission accomplished here because of course we've got ourselves some well what else we have quite a lot of chicken in fact to go through so I will be delivering a lot of this, as I mentioned, to friends and family. Now all I have to do is wait for it to cool off, and then I'm going to have to reserve this um, this oil, because it's peanut oil, and there's no reason we could, probably couldn't find something else with it, but not tonight at this point. Pour some honey on that chicken. Oh, well, uh, this is made with crown fried chicken spice, which is actually rather spicy. I'm not even sure if honey would go with it. It's more like a, a cayenne a pepper type of spice. Um, we all have our own opinions. You include. I, I was just peacefully stating mine. Anyway, I came to watch you cook and not talk politics. I agree there. Yes, that's why that's the end of this. In fact, this video is uh, just about to reach the end as well. I do not like politics. I've never liked politics. It does really nothing but cause he headaches and hatred and division. And even though, as I mentioned, I am going to say something political come election day, otherwise... I am no professional. I am not a debater. I am, don't heavily follow politics. So I am really not the best person to talk with about politics. That's one reason why I like cooking. It's unfortunate, though, that politics really has invaded our lives to the point where it's impossible not to see it every day and not to talk about and talk about it when even things like wearing masks, for instance, have become a, a political um, a, a, yeah, have uh, too much uh, politics involved. So I guess I think I should probably end with it on this way because I really don't want this to end on a bad note. Uh, thank you for your pumpkin pie recipe. Well, thank you very much. Oh, yeah, no, I love the crust on that pumpkin pie. 
But nonetheless, I did say I was hoping that things would get uh, pretty weird here tonight. Um, not weird enough to get in trouble with YouTube, and thank you very much for not doing anything that got us in trouble with YouTube. Uh, but still, I mean, here we are talking about uh, a religious cult, and I've pretty much c come clean to the fact that I was a member of a crazed UFO cult for 17 years. And proud of it, because come July 5th at 7 a.m., you better believe you're going to burn. If you haven't sent your $35 to J.R. Bob Dobbs and, and paid for your eternal salvation, oh, yeah, how could I forget this? That's the other good thing about that. You see, we are the only religion that offers you eternal salvation or triple your money back. That is Bob's promise to you. And believe me, Bob sold it. I smoked it. That settles it. If I die and I end up going to hell, you better believe Bob will be there with a uh, refund check of $105 for me. So, hey, what better deal can you get from that um, from any other religion? So, uh, having said that, though, nonetheless... The, um, this has actually been a lot of fun, and I really do like how this chicken turned out. And boy, is there a lot of it. <laughs> so, yeah, we are going to have to start eating some of this. Um, this is the large cast iron fish pan. You can indeed deep fry in a Dutch oven or really any big cast iron uh, pan that you like, even in an enameled one. And... If you have the uh, resources and you don't mind the mess, uh, then yes, do some deep frying because it is a lot of fun. That's really the best part. Where's the biscuits? I didn't have time to make them. <laughs> uh, I will probably be making those tomorrow morning. And besides, leftover fried chicken, cold fried chicken from the fridge is great too. Mm. Um, I guess at this point, though, as I said, I can only thank everybody very much for showing up for this. This, has, again, has been a confession of, as I said, something that happened in my life 10 years ago, and I'm, that was a really a uh, life changer for me, and I'm very happy to, to do that. I wanted to do fries, but we are getting kind of late. I mean, it's been almost two hours already. <laughs> uh, get some hot sauce, Frank's or Red Devil, definitely. And I'm, And once again, though, I'm very... Grateful for everybody who showed up and actually stayed. Uh, really, yeah, seeing all of you folks here is one of the big reasons why these live uh, shows here are a lot of fun. And I very much enjoy it. I'm not turning my channel into only live videos. I've done a few of them recently because, hey, they're a great way to fill time. I will admit that. But uh, also, as I said, they are easy to do and they're a lot of fun. And that's really the whole point of uh, cooking in general, not just in cast iron, but in general, is that we want it to be fun. And believe me, this is a lot of fun. And I'm really glad to be doing this. To And I'm also especially glad to be doing this here for you. And thank you very much for watching, folks. Um, I guess at this point, I, all I can say now, um, do you filter and reuse your oil? Well, I don't do this often enough that I've, uh, I've done that regularly. This stuff, I probably will. But we'll talk a little bit more about this in the comments because, again, we are approaching two hours here. And, and uh, we've done everything that we needed to do. So uh, thank you so much. Which do you think is worse, Jehovah 1 or Jehovah 2? Well, Jehovah 2 is definitely an imitation of Jehovah 1 because Jehovah is an alien and still threatens this planet. Good job. <laughs> When will we do this again? Um, well, I do plan on doing another uh, live chat next Wednesday, Cast Iron Wednesday. I've been trying to do these every Wednesday. Uh, the next one, I'm thinking the topic of that will be put a lid on it. Because, you know, cast iron lids are underrated, and there is a lot that can be said about that. So now I think we are all set here. I've got to clean up this mess, and we've got to eat some chicken. Thank you very much once again, everyone, for uh, showing up. And for and I do hope you've enjoyed this. And I will uh, see you again. So thank you, everybody. And all right, have a good evening. Anyone but Trump. <laughs>